Let's make the almost inconceivable nano world conceivable. The naked eye can see the diameter of a human hair. That's one tenth of a millimeter or 100,000 nanometers. To understand the small, we're gonna scale it up to skyscraper proportions and return to our human hair and blow it up to the size of the Empire State Building. A typical human cell, say a red blood cell, would rise to the 10th floor. A bacteria cell, the third floor. Working down our scale, a run-of-the-mill protein molecule would be the same height as a small dog, about a foot and a half. And a nanometer, on our Empire State scale, it's less than a quarter of an inch. That's about the size of five microscopic atoms placed end to end. This is the scale where much of what we'll be talking about is taking place. This is our evening of the teeny and the weeny, and it's uh, as, that, as they just said. So I'm going to bring in my, my teeny weeny compatriots here. First, uh, Peter Huffman. He is a physicist, professor of physics at Wayne State University, associate dean of their liberal arts college, author of a very nifty little book. It's really quite a delightful read called Life's Ratchet, How Molecular Machines Extract Order from Chaos. It explores what it's like deep, deep, deep down in nature where things are very, very small and the strange things that happen down there that don't seem to happen up here where, where we are. Because where I live, if I were to drop a pencil out of my hand, uh, it would fall in a pretty predictable way usually. And you know, I could do that. And although I know my hand is made of atoms and atoms are mostly empty and this is mostly empty, doesn't feel empty to me, it's just a, a table. And cannonballs, not that I have any, uh, would go, I assume, where I'd want them to go. I don't know why I wrote that. I don't ever deal with cannonballs. Um, so we lead a very orderly existence up here, and yet everything that we're made of, our fundament, says him, is a swirling, cloudy, chaotic mess down at the level of atoms. And exploring that puzzle, how do you get a clock from a cloud? That's Peter's passion, so that's him. So that's Peter. Uh, Next, I'm going to bring in Dr. Omid Farakazad. He is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, MD at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He directs the Laboratory of, Na of Nanomedicine and Biomaterials. He's also launched three biotech companies, Bind Therapeutics, Blend Therapeutics, and Selecta Bi Biosciences. He, actually, what he is, he's a pioneer. He's a real leader in the extremely small-scale cancer detection world. We'll hear about, about that in a minute. He's the author of roughly 95 science papers, holds more than 125 issued or pending US and international pa patents. Basically, he's one of your, ba he's one of your, your sort of Ben Franklin-style tinkerers in a very sophisticated sort of way. So that's him. And our third one is uh, Metin Seti. Bring on Metin. He's an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon in electrical and computer engineering. He directs their nano robotics lab. He specializes in miniature mobile robots and bio-inspired adhesives and is known to be especially fond of geckos and particularly gecko feet because these are lizards that can go right up a wall and run, run across the ceiling. They don't, would never fall off, and it doesn't seem like they seem to think that they're upside down. And Methin would come from the school of, I want to do what they do. Uh. He's also <laughs> the author, uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Microbiorobotics, where you can read about, this is, I just went there just to see what would you read if you read this thing. And their headline, one of the three articles this month is, Effects of Squeeze Film Damping on Clamp Clamp Beam MEMs Filters and other fascinating things. Um, <laughs> he's also a pretty keen observer of nature as it is, and he thinks about maybe giving nature a few new nanotechno creatures. So let's welcome him, and off we go. Um, let's, let's deal, first of all, with this word nano. What, what, what does it mean? 
Nano, N-A-N-O. Well, 10 to the minus 9. <laughs> oh, it's a math, it's a prefix for a mathematical 10 to the minus 9. Right. What does that mean for regular people? Uh, for me, it means like my fingernail in every one second grows one nanometer. So just look and look very long and you will see it's growing. But imagine every second it's only growing one nanometer. And that's my measure of nanometer. Okay. And, <laughs> and is nano some Roman or Greek prefix, or is it? It's it, Greek. It's Greek. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just to start us off, um, this really intrigues me. Like sitting on the bench next to Matthew is, um, I should. I don't know if I'm allowed to walk, but this is um, unbelievable to me. This is. It's under, I, you can't see this, but there's like a light here, and then there's like a Petri dish, and then in the Petri dish, there's something basically half the size of a poppy seed, I would say. What is, what is that? I mean, it's, it's, it, is the, it is the smallest dot that you could leave unnoticed in a Petri dish, except that it's well lit. What, it, what is it? So, this is a micro-robot. Indeed, if you look at it, it has kind of claws, which are monoplaters, so they're grippers, so they can It has move. claws, did you say? Yeah. No, it's just a dot. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a dot. Yeah, to you, yes. Uh, Do you have a bigger picture of it? Oh, like, turn around. Yeah, this is, this is a miniature microscope that shows it in higher zoom. So you can see that it has grippers at the end. And the black I don't see grippers at the end. I see some sort of maze or something. <laughs> It looks like a kind of a jaw of an in, like an ant. So it can oh, that's to you a gripper. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It can grab. Is this, is this on the dot? Yes. Can so you, like if you move this, would it move on the screen? Yeah, we can use different pieces of it, but oh, basically. It really it is. is on the, oh my God. I can't explain to you how small <laughs> this is that it would have any architecture on it. What's it for? So this robot goes inside the human body. It is remotely actuated with magnetic fields, and it can do uh, diagnosis and manipulation inside human body or inside microfluidic systems like lab on a chip type of biotechnology uh, systems. Okay, well before I ask you why you would make this, uh, let's just talk about the environment it, it, where these things can be found. When things this size are behaving, are natural. When you go to the real life zoo of these very, very tiny things, which will be atoms, atoms, I guess. Um, you say in your book that it's sort of chaos where they live. And then you mention things like motion or commotion. Can you explain like, if you're an atom, being an atom on an ordinary atomy day, <laughs> what is going on around you? It's just a complete chaos of water molecules in your, in your body that just you fly just around. You just have molecules. Really I'm, ad I'm atoms. Okay, I'm you're an atom, say, in the air or something like that. You get bombarded by other atoms all the time from random direction at very high speed and just shuts There's no such around. thing as a sedentary, quiet atom on a only wheelchair if you, kind of... If only if you cool it down to absolute zero, but, okay. but that, you know, the normal temperatures we're used to, it's just chaos. So, and why is that? Why do well, you not that's, find that's what, what heat is. So heat is, when you feel warm, what you really feel is that, you know, the, the atoms, the molecules in your body are basically oscillating, and that's, that's what heat is. So once you warm something up, what that really means is that all the particles have motion. So if you were to simply live at the bottom of existence where the atoms are, you would just find wiggle, jiggle, wiggle, jiggle, bang, bang, wiggle, jiggle, bang. Yeah, well, actually, a lot of... Uh, bang, 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 because they're getting bombarded all the time at very high speed. And so the speeds can be of the order of like a, a, a jet fighter, basically flying a very small distance and crashing into something, bouncing off, crashing into something else. It's just oh, so it's extremely, it's like, it's like a stormy weather. Yeah, it's like a tornado at the nanoscale, if you want. Well, but look at this thing. It shows no feel of a tornado. It's solid, sedentary, quiet, placid, and boring. Right. How did something like this emerge from something like what you're describing? So when you average over many, many of them, and you look at the macroscopic scale, all this kind of random stuff can pretty much cancels out. Plus you have forces between these things so that on average, you know, the molecules of this table will stay in the same place. 
They jiggle around. So that's a mathematical answer. That doesn't right. make sense to me sensually. If I, if I get a lot of dancing bricks, and they're dancing, 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 <laughs> I'm not going to get a solid steel building. I will get a wiggly building. Yet I have here a very solid table based on dancing constituents. Right, so the distance that they actually move is not very fast. Before they kind of bounce into each other, in this case they actually link to each other. They just move a few nanometers, they move very high speed, but they only few, move a few oh, nanometers. Oh, so this is moving, but I just don't, can't see it. You can't see it. All right. Um, I want to now go to what I think this is, what you're about to see. First of all, what you're about to see is going on in you right now, everywhere in you. We're going to let you look briefly at a cell made by the chemistry department at Harvard University, which was getting a little worried that it wasn't getting chemistry majors. So they thought maybe they should do something jazzy. So they know that textbooks in chemistry, you know, the chemistry always looks like circles and very boring. So they said, let's just actually make it like it is. So, so this is basically what you see, what's going on in your cells right now. These are different fibers assembling, disassembling your cells. What this is, is this a, This thing? is a, a, a molecular machine that walks around in your cells right now. It's called a kinesin and transports things. So for example, when things want to move around your cells, they don't just float around randomly. They actually I, I like actively that. moved around with little machines, little robots, nanobots that power your cells. Um, what you see here is actually the, uh, an amazing machine coming out of these little pores which actually assembles other machines. This is like the factory floor of your cells. It's called a ribosome. It reads your RNA. RNA is, uh, trans uh, comes from the DNA. It's translated into RNA, and then it basically uh, gets read out by uh, these ribosomes, and they make new machines, which then do other things. So there's all kinds of machines in your cells, things that rotate, things that walk, things that make other machines, things that read RNA, things that copy DNA, that open, uh, sh Let's look at this shuffle again things while we talk about it. Can we look at it a second time? I, yeah. I, I, first of all, for how fast is this in real life, all these things going on? Oh, so, some of those things can happen quite fast, some kind of slow. And that's actually interesting thing of the nanoscale. You can create all kinds of time scales depending on how many pieces have to act together. Some things can well, happen little in guy who's nanoseconds, some in milliseconds, some in microseconds. Um, you know, they, they're actually... Um, they make steps in a kind of millisecond range, I would say. In the and what? Like milliseconds or thousands of a second. And we, a little so bit. So you can have this. So it's actually boom, faster boom, than that. It's boom, much boom, faster boom. than that. So they made it kind of looking. So this is a garbage man. That big wet sack is just cell garbage. And he's going to take it up this tube, or it is going to take it up this tube. Yeah, there are some machines that walk to the, from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell to kick garbage out, and others that go from the outside of the cell to the inside cell to bring the good stuff in. So they're specialized machines. They only walk in certain directions. Is this, what about the color? That's pretend, right? Yeah, that's, you know, those things are so small, you really can't, uh, you know, it would be very dark, I mean, unless you had stage lights or something. <laughs> yeah. This is a copier? Yeah, that's a copier, and it, that little wormy thing are coming out is a new protein coming out, and here's a new protein has formed, two of them linked together, and they make a new nanomachine that goes off to do its thing. So this is the build, this is what plants have and animals have and we have, we're built from these things. Right, that's, and you this look, is what's going on in your cells right now. And so you look inside and you, you, I think it would be fair to say that this seems extraordinarily complicated, oh, yeah. extraordinarily sophisticated, extraordinarily, to use a careful word, miraculous. Because if I say miraculous, I would let me just try this out. Because I'm imagining that none of the three of you would think of this as a miracle. But I don't understand why you don't get a little touch of that in you. Because it would seem hard. For example, that tube that's self-assembled. Mm -hmm. A self-assembling tube. We haven't even invented that up here yet. Um, and a garbage man that isn't alive, that has feet, that goes clump, clump, clump in the right direction up a tube. I mean, that's pretty, like, you, it seems to look like it had to be designed. Discuss. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would agree with you that it seems that way, but except for the fact that we actually know that, that they, have, they have evolved, because we know all the little uh, uh, machines like that that are a little bit less sophisticated than some other bacteria, and there's a whole family tree of these things. So, for example, this walking one, uh, if you take one of those types, which are called a myosin, there's a family tree where there's a hundred different ones of these and different bacteria, yeasts, uh, different animal cells, 
plant cells, and some of them are less sophisticated, and some are more sophisticated. You have some that only have one leg, they kind of more hop rather than walk. Uh, so you have, like, you have all kinds of variations of them. You can see how they kind of derive from one of each other over time. So we know that they're, they do evolve. So what am I missing? Are you saying that, that if you have enough time, complexity will emerge or can emerge? And that's just, it's just I can't appreciate how long this took? Is yeah, that? I think that's part of it. I mean, when you realize in nature there's a lot of stuff that's pretty complex, even things that are not alive are fairly complex. I mean, our planet's very complex, a star can be very complex. All these things, when you, when you bring in the, the laws of nature, uh, and, and this kind of chaotic motion, you know, which kind of mixes things up and, and then you give it a lot of time, then complexity can actually emerge over time. We, okay, I, don't so th I wouldn't say we completely understand all the specific steps yet, but all, all the um, evidence that we have points to the way that this must have happened that way. And I think eventually you'll but figure you out the steps. But you say that because there's already motion in the universe, that the little things are moving, that's right. good. Right. They bump into each other, things change. Right. Right. Second thing is time. Right. Excellent. So you got that. Then you have something called the laws of nature. Right. Now, in your view, the laws of nature sculpt this motion so that eventually, instead of just getting boing, 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 you get purposeful motion like a protein walking up a self uh, of tube. Of course, you do need you do need evolution to get to that point. So there, there's a lot of, these are very sophisticated structures, so just randomly they're not going to assemble themselves. It's, it needs to be a very step-by-step -step process over a long period of time. And the two of you, the silent ones for the moment, are you both convinced that what we've just seen is a, an evolved state that comes from chaos, that has been sculpted by the laws of nature, and has turned this, has created structure and purposeful motion and all the things we've just seen. So I would actually share your view that it is miraculous, so let me say that. But I would actually say that um, the combination of randomness and complexity over time results in order. And what I mean by that is, um, if periodically you make changes, and those changes are very small changes, and that change either improves an outcome, which, let's say, uh, that garbage man walking up the ladder, or it actually makes it less efficient. If it's a more efficient process, it will self-perpetuate. If it's a less efficient process, it will drop off. Now, the reason um, today some problems in medicine, for example, involves superbugs is because the process by which they can change is much faster than you and I can. Yeah. And so they read out on the impact of that change for them happens in less than an hour, in you and I, happens in our lifetime. Right? So for them, they have much more opportunity to change and see the outcome, change and see the outcome, and you may give a drug, that drug, let's just say, um, you know, it's supposed to block that garbage man, but that bacteria keeps changing it until it finds a way to get around that drug and that garbage man continues to walk up. So I actually, I'm, I'm actually in agreement um, with Peter that you know, the uh, randomness and time can create order. Well, here's, this has all been a trick question because the three of you, or at least you two anyway, well, actually all three of you, are in the business of manipulating these little things and beginning to design them for our tastes, our purposes, and our pleasure. Now, the one thing that time gives you is a kind of safety. As you just said, you only get to evolve if you are what they call it, if you do, if you do the right, if you keep the, the life form that you're sustaining sustained. So if you do something wrong, you, you're not going to reproduce, but someone else will reproduce faster than you. So that's kind of a very safe way to change. And here you are, you three, stepping up to your lab desks and stuff and think, well, now let's see what we can, maybe I can repair a cancer, or maybe I can, uh, I don't know, whatever it is. Like, here are some of the things, um, dirty socks that, these are the things that you hear about with nanotechnology. I decide maybe I'm German, so I don't ever change my underwear. Apparently this is, uh, you're German, I guess, so maybe this is unfair. But I always thought 
from friends <laughs> that Germans just don't change their underwear as often as other people. But they would like to have a Once nano a day, sock. You know, so, I mean, well, so you, you'd put on, your, you never take <laughs> off your socks, but your socks have these nanoparticles in that kick away the odors. All right, so that seems innocent. I don't know what will happen when my sock dissolves. Maybe these things will go off and <laughs> attach to, I don't know. Or uh, baseball bats. Like apparently you can now make a baseball bat that's so, do you know the baseball bat issue? No. Oh, I, I, apparently you can make a baseball bat that's so sticky that it will catch the ball instead of hit the ball. <laughs> so, okay, you can do these things, but I'm just, before we begin, I'm just wondering, are you a little worried about your power? This is the, fr this is the Jeff Goldblum question in all those movies. The one who sits in the corner and goes, I don't know, life has its own, you know. Um, are you just a little bit worried, as you approach this, like, are, you're just people living in a hundred year cycle, if you're lucky, it's 80 years, so you don't know bat stuff about, like these, these are billion year old safe creations. So. Yeah, let me take over a little bit as a robotics person. Um, you're right that nature by evolution has created these uh, good enough solutions to survive. Uh, but as human beings, uh, we are now going beyond that, or as engineers or as scientists, that we have our own synthetic problems that we are trying to be perfect. So in that sense, what we are doing right now is we are going beyond nature first because we don't have the constraints that nature has. And also objective-wise, we are just not trying to survive only. We are really trying to get things better and better uh, in some objectives of everyone's uh, personal and also community reasons. So in that sense, we are solving the problems in a different way, as you say, and we have the luxury of knowledge and manipulation capabilities that we can play with molecules, systems, many things to do our objectives. So that brings a lot of capabilities, but also responsibilities, as you say, because you're playing and uh, you know, you're playing with cells, a human body, so safety in a robot is a big issue. Indeed, that's one of our biggest technical challenges uh, to make a medical robot, because what happens if the robot fails inside your body? Yeah. So that's why we designed the robot to be safe. Like nature has evolved to design itself to be suboptimal to work uh, for the given function, and safety, of course, is one of them. But if you think, if Omid were to go to his board at his stockholders at Bind Therapeutics, Blend Therapeutics, and Selecta, and he said, look, I think I need another half century just to make sure this is safe, or give me like 400 years. <laughs> what would be your, your, what would be their reaction? I would think they'd say, mm. so that's, but so, so there's a lot of questions embedded in that question. So the first, let me just, at, at a very high level, give my, you my sort of, uh, clinical answer, because I'm also a physician, which is that if I look back, all the, um, what I would consider revolutionary changes in medicine came with an enormous amount of skepticism about what the long-term sequelae and toxicity would be, right? Um, the long-term sequelae of what? You went well, to Harvard. Well, you have to. <laughs> well, by the way, I didn't, but, but so the long-term consequence of our actions, right? Ah, so okay. if you look at Look at radiation. I mean, radiation, you know, raised a lot of concerns. Today, it's used in the treatment of many cancers, right? Genetic engineering, we're gonna be cloning each other and there's gonna be two Omid and, you know, and two of Peter around. Maybe two of Peter would be a good idea, but two of Omid would be a bad idea. But, 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 but then, you know, but genetic engineering is giving us the tools for regenerative medicine, creating organs when we need organs, why do you have to wait for a cadaver to come when you need, you know, when you need a heart? Uh, why can't you regenerate a muscle tissue uh, after a heart attack? And so, um, and I think if you look at nanotechnology, there were a lot of people who looked at it and compared it to other nanostructures, like asbestos. So look what happened to asbestos. How do you know these nanoparticles aren't going to be asbestos? And the bottom line is, that when we're addressing... I hadn't thought of that, that's a good... So you put asbestos in buildings as a fire retardant, it right. seems like a glorious thing to do, sure. and then only later do you discover that it has a Believe problem. me, I've heard that many times. And the answer I would give is the following. If you're treating a disease um, like pancreatic cancer, where the overall survival in five years, if you, if you have that disease, is you know, low single-digit percent, so the, the, now the thing is, 
if there is a nanotherapeutic that can significantly enhance life, is that the right trade-off? There's no question that we're going to learn a lot about what nanoparticles and nanomedicine and the long-term um, impact that these things on the body are. <laughs> and, and, Your long-term is going to be 20 years. He just explained that that long-term was two and a half billion years. Right. Well, I, <laughs> by the way, I mean, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with you that the, um, uh, you know, the long-term effect of these are yet to be seen, right? Well, let's just take, let's take an extreme case. What is the long-term effect if, in fact, we can eradicate cancer and cardiovascular disease? Two big killers. What happens to planet Earth if people live to be 150, right? Ooh. By the way, you don't need to live a billion well, years to find the answer to that. You, you just gave me a pleasant, uh, an unpleasant, pleasant problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say this because these are extremely good questions we, we, that crossed our mind, but, but today uh, the answer to a lot of these questions is unknown, and, um, and I'm excited about the ability to be able to treat better drugs, better treatments that are going to have near-term impact on human lives. Okay, I'm just telling you, we're about to go into the good part here, but just watch these guys because they're going to help you but some part of them is just dangerous, just my view. <laughs> um, Richard Feynman gave a speech, which you mention in your book, and that seems to be like the sort of first big trumpet blast in this world. Like what, what, was, what, he, what was he talking about? So uh, most people know Richard Feynman was somebody who always had very iconoclastic and crazy ideas, and so 1959 he gave his talk, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And his point was that the f there there's was plenty of room at the bottom. At the bottom, yeah. What does that Where mean? It's very small. Oh. So his point was like the laws of physics don't really keep us from, say, writing uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica on the, on the head of a needle or uh, making a tiny machine li like the machines that are in our cells. Uh, because obviously the laws of physics don't contradict that because it's already happening in our cells. Right. So he said, why aren't we doing these things? So he gave a real talk about that. Interestingly, the people who listened to their talk in 1959 thought, oh, that's kind of funny, but that's kind of crazy. So, so they kind of forgot about it. He gave actually two challenges. He said, um, if somebody can make a motor that's 400, an electromotor that's 400 microns, 1 64th of an inch at each side, a cube, they get $1,000 from Richard Feynman. Somebody did it in like one year. Really? Just using a regular, making a regular motor really tiny. But then nothing really I happened. I think if you're at Caltech, you probably shouldn't make bets like I that. I know, I know. So there's probably somebody who can actually do yeah. that kind of thing. But then really nothing happened until about the 1980s. And people kind of forgot about all this stuff. And then I think what really happened is that we got the tools to actually do some of those things. Well, let's talk about those a little bit. I, I have, I'm going to ask you some stupid questions because about these kind of things, I think most of us are pretty stupid. I, um, first of all, how do you play with an atom? Um, what does that even mean? Like, Atoms, I thought, are sort of more or less the same, and also immortal. So, uh, what do you do? Do you put them into new, like, when you play with atoms, like you hear about buckyball, you hear about carbon structures. So, is, I'm imagining someone with a tweezer, obviously he can't have a tweezer, because mm -hmm. he has a tweezer, and he goes and he gets one atom, and he puts it next to another atom, and then he makes, a, oh look, I'm going to make a, I don't know, I'll make a star today, or I'll write the letter I, B, and M, or something like that. You know? it, how does that really work? Well, actually, you, you can do that. I mean, I actually... You I can't just, have a tweezer. No, you don't have a tweezer, but you can have a little fine tip, and you can, you know, people have done it since uh, the early 90s. A tip uh, of what? A tip of a metal with other atoms, and you just push uh, atoms around, or throw them, pull them around on, on the surface, and you can make them into little shapes, and. You have to do it at low temperature because of this uh, well, But how problem. do you even see one? How could you see an atom? Okay, so that that's comes down to this whole invention in the 1980s of the scanning probe microscopes. A what? Where scanning probe microscopes, where you have a probe and you scan it, and it's a microscope, but it's not an optical microscope. It's not like your typical microscope you look through the, this light. Because it's too small to see them with light. So what you have to yeah, do... Yeah, you, you can't bounce light off an atom. It's too small, right? No, so nothing, nothing, yeah. So, so what you have to do, you actually have to, have to feel them. Because atoms, you know, uh, one of the things is that they um, will exert a force on other atoms. So if you bring a, a very sharp tip which ends in an atom to another atom, it will feel a little force. And that force actually is... What do you uh, mean you feel them? With what? 
with a little spring. So you make a little micrometer spring that's about the size, the typically the size of the eye of a fly. You can buy them these days. A spring? A little spring, a little cantilever, a little beam of, of material with a little sharp tip at the end. And you huh. just bring it close to, to one of those atoms and it can feel the force and it can bend a little bit like about a nanometer, maybe a fraction of a nanometer. Bouncing a laser off it, you can detect that that motion, and you can. So, are you, you like a it. bat going boink, 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 and, and and getting the image of an atom, or are you? Are, does this like grade up, and you can feel the atom? Yeah, you basically feel it. So you feel, feel it with it. a tiny little finger, so to speak. That's you know just maybe a hundred micrometers long, and and. What do you call people who do this? What do you call them? Uh, atom crazy pushers? people? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> what are, what a, 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 yeah, atomic force microscopists, I suppose. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> um, and and uh, now, how do you m m move them along? I guess I'm wondering. Like, it's like, so you have an, a thing to show us, which is like the easiest. Uh, this is not, we're not going to do an atom. You have a something you swallow. So let's, uh, let's we'll make it a little bit bigger. I guess the problem is. Maybe we should keep it out for just a second. How do you push an atom? Like, do you, can you, you can't blow on it or? No, you just, you know, use the same tip again. Now you get, bring it a bit closer. First you just kind of feel it. It's just like you actually move something in the real, the big world. If you want to just feel there's something there, you just feel it. But if you want to push it, you apply more force. So you just get so closer. So it's that simple, you just push it. Yeah, you just push With it. With this spring. Right, with the sharp tip at the end. Yeah. Okay, to make this more, a little bit bigger, let's go to something, well, you have a, you have a, actually a, a, something you swallow? It's what is? Yep. So, this is a little bit, we are starting from a little bit bigger size as an example. Okay. So this is a swallowable capsule robot, uh, which has a camera on board, wireless communication, and it has... It has a camera, you say? Yes. There's a very tiny camera, the black part, so this, and you see LED where, lights. Where is the camera? It's at the end here. Okay. And then there are small magnets inside. As you mentioned, to manipulate anything, you need some physical force. In this case, this capsule has magnets inside, and another external magnet can exert force on this capsule, and inside your body, this can be navigated. So it can roll inside your stomach, it can be stopped, it can go backward and forward really? as a robot. Well, how would you put it in you? So you swallow it, so it's a, a pill you size. You swallow it? So yeah, this is completely wireless robot, as you see in the video. Also, it's made out of a soft material so that it can deform and it's very safe to use. As you mentioned, safety is our first rule about the design. And by rolling inside your stomach's tissue surface, uh, the doctor can stop it. And then by controlling the external force, you can indeed eject a drug. Here you see this blue thing. Oh, is a wow, it spilled, it made a little pee or something. <laughs> exactly. And it can do this many times. <laughs> and it can actively image your uh, body so that you can see where you want exactly. Do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> Let's see what's it again. Well, first of all, uh, who is running? It looks like it's, it's got a will. Like, is, it some, is it being driven by something? You see that there's an external magnet that the doctor has full control of. Ah. And, and indeed, it's moving outside, like you, you use a magnet outside your body and it's moving the robot inside your body. Oh, so, so there's a doctor outside of you with a magnet and then there's this little thing wobbling in, and so the doctor is moving it. Exactly, that's why it's safe, so that you don't have any, you know, decision. Is the doctor that, squeezing out that blue juice? <laughs> yeah, so doctor says that that area has a disease so that he or she decides to uh, eject the drug at that point. And also, the same robot can do biopsy, so it can cut some Whoa, pictures. Whoa, wait a second. It, it's a three-in-one. It can take pictures. It can leak, or whatever that is, pour. <laughs> and it can cut? Yes. With what? What is it cutting with? Uh, so the, the biopsy is a common procedure in GI tract that you want a small piece of your tissue to decide if there is a disease or not. Because sometimes camera images are not sufficient or wouldn't tell you the, the level of the disease. So doctor needs to take a piece of your tissue and do analysis afterwards. 
so oh. that we need to pick up this capsule later and do some analysis, which is a little bit dirty. Well, wait a second, does it like have a knife in its pocket? Or like where, where is the cutting thing? It's inside the middle. So it's very safely located, so it doesn't cause any damage. Uh -huh. But as, as in the drug releasing case, when a doctor controls the force and presses this thing on purpose, the knife comes out and gets a, gets a small It's piece. like a switchblade. So yes, it. exactly. Yeah. Whoa. And so you can then take a little bit of something and then bring it to the doctor. Exactly. How do you, I'm assuming that you bring it to the doctor in the old-fashioned way? <laughs> <laughs> in, in the biopsy case, yes, you need to pick it up, coming out of natural ways. But other, other cases, we don't pick That's it up. That's the intern does that? Or who? who uh? <laughs> <laughs> That's the cost of high technology. <laughs> I see. <laughs> huh. Wow. How, uh, is this something that it can be used on humans yet, or is it something for... Uh, right now, we are doing animal testing. So, uh, pigs Who's have the lucky animal? Uh, uh, porcines have very porcine. similar oh. uh, digestive system as humans. So, oh. we do such testing in, inside pigs. All right, well, that's, uh, that is kind of amazing. I'm just trying to think. I'd like to see that one more time, but I've run out of things to say about it. Uh, all right, so... so um, oh, one other thing. So, it doesn't have a... In order to take a picture, it would need a light, wouldn't it? And it's dark in the tummy. Exactly. So there's an LED light on the uh, close to the camera area. So it, sh it basically lights up, and that's why you need some battery on the device. So it lights wow. up the camera lighting and then gets images and send images using wireless technology to outside the human body, which is all doable right now with the current technology. Does it hurt? To swallow one of these? No. no. It need, this is the you can't ask a pig. I mean, I don't know what a pig would tell you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it need, the current practice by doctors is uh, they use flexible endoscopes, as you know, and which are very discomforting because you need to, you know, have sedation. It's very, uh, also cause some uh, pain, so that's why you get a lot of drugs. So in this case, there is no tether, so it's wireless, so you swallow it. So in that sense, it's very comfortable to use. In the, in the case of just imaging, you swallow it, you go to home, do your da daily activities, images are recorded, and you go and uh, give the images to the doctor, and he or she decides if you have a problem or not. So this is kind of a new, minimally invasive technology. I'm just trying to think, in, in the lawsuit that I'm planning for this, which I, so <laughs> I'm in court and I'm saying, so I swallowed this guy, and then he took out a knife and he stabbed me, <laughs> but I put him in me, but he misused his opportunity. And, and he didn't biopsy me, he just hurt me. I don't know what kind of a tort that is. I guess you'll find out sooner enough. Is that that's a great point. Indeed, that's why we never would allow anyone to do a surgical operation by themselves. Because, as you say, legally and also technically, it's, uh, it's a big danger. So those kind of uh, what we call therapeutic operations are mainly done by a doctor directly. So responsibility is on the doctor's hands. All right, let, let me ask you, uh, so you have a magnetic kind of uh, way of giving it motion. Um, is, could you add legs to these things? Could you um, we could definitely, get crawl? Yeah, the first versions of this capsule had legs that can basically propel by opening and closing. But the safety-wise, the legs can basically uh, can be causing some damages to the tissues. That's why we changed the design from a leg design to the soft design, which can yeah. change the shape by... Because these things are crawling along the edges of, I guess, intestines and esophaguses and kidneys and things like that. Yes, so they can go and... This, this version has no damage possibility at all. This is another example of a very tiny robot, and this case is oh, really okay. micron size. So uh, the capsule, as you saw, it's fingertip size, which is what we call millimeter scale. So this star-shaped robot uh, is also magnetic material that we fabricate in the lab, and it's right now manipulating that object by a remote user's full control by computer. So this is like your hair diameter size, the part, and the robot. Uh, and as you what are we fixing? Is this uh, a broken what? So it's basically demonstrating that it's really precise. So basically, because when you want to do anything with these robots for manipulation, as we mentioned, we need to be really precise to make sure that uh, it's not causing any damage and it's doing the right thing that we want to achieve. And in this case, this is a big robotic problem. How can you put a peg in a hole? In the, this is just a demonstration of the concept that this micro-robot can put that peg 
in a micro hole. Why didn't you use a hammer? Why didn't you make a star out of your pusher? That's a sort of a Disney turn there, I think. <laughs> so the shape of the robots are very important. When you get smaller and smaller, the shape gives a big advantage. Because of the star shape, that part can be much easily manipulated. If you look at it, it uses edges of the star to make some pushes better and then use the middle of the edge so that it will be more stable to push the part precisely. Oh. So the shape matters a lot for small So you robots. chose the six point, like Israelis would be kind of thrilled, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> we have no political purpose here. <laughs> huh. It's fully functional engineering design. Um, so let me ask you about the, the energy question here. Because um, so far you've, um, you've magnetized them. First of all, you've used the tummy muscles to just push them through. Then you've used a magnet to draw them through. I guess a battery is too heavy, I mean, to actually have a power pack. So that. So battery, of course, we can make very tiny, but the problem with batteries are, or the power sources are, at the small scale, they are not so much power capacity. So that means like you can only operate for a few hours or several hours. But imagine all your GI tracks, so it takes like six to 10 hours to get something from your mouth to you know, anus, it's a long time. So operation time. Uh, you just said anus very nicely. It just slipped through the sentence there. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. that's the nature of it. You're a pro, all right. Yeah. But so, and then you showed us your star version of a hammer. So I'm just, um, I, I, I guess we should be reminded like how we do it. Like you mentioned in your book that the way humans, like you'll eat a hamburger say, and then the hamburger will get dissolved and then will turn into bits of hamburger and then it gets down to the point where they're so itty bitty that they can, f they can fuel a cell, each one of your trillions of cells. You have a power equation which I found quite interesting um, for a human being. How much power do we use in a day? Yeah, so, so the uh, interesting thing is when people think, uh, you know, there are these books out there we say like, oh, the human body has so much energy. If you, you know, you know, the movie The Matrix, for example, where they yes. say that, you know, the machines the using human bodies are, and all this kind of stuff. But actually, if you look at the total energy that we take in in terms of our food and how much, uh, you know, divided by a day, it's, it's basically the power that we use, which is the energy used per time. It's the rate of how fast you use energy. It's about 120 watts. So it's about like a big size light bulb. Which is kind of Wait, amazing. You're saying like, like Michael Jordan. No, no that's not fair. Oh, yeah, well, no, no, no. no. Yeah. Let's say uh, uh, <laughs> just Jerry. Jerry Smith. Yes. Mr. Average. He will eat his hamburgers and his late potato chips and, and his Coca Colas or whatever it is. Right. And he will be, in a course of 24 hours, he will, he will create as much energy as was required to light a 120 watt bulb for a day. Right. And we do all that on 120 watts, all the things we do? Yeah, and that's... Would that's Michael Jordan, like, get twice that, or, like, is there a range? Well, you know, uh, temporarily, of course, you have a kind of a much higher power, power output if you're, you know, running and trying to right. dunk a, a basketball. Well, that suggests that we're extraordinarily efficiently made, that we could take 120 watts and do everything. This includes thinking, dreaming, eating, running, kissing, crying, sneezing, brushing your teeth, and everything else we do. Right. Sleeping. And I think the way this whole nano idea comes out that ultimately all the work is done on the nanoscale because actually if you look at the, you know, uh, talking physics speak here for a moment and the thermodynamics, you actually see that if, if you're most efficient if you do things in very small steps. So by having all the, your body actually functioning by having many little machines in there that do things on a very small scale is actually very efficient. The reason it puzzles me that we're that efficient is I would think that when you get very little things get very clear for you. Like, if I'm a sperm, say, trying to go up a vaginal canal, I, I, I have to combat all of the, the mucus and the things that are in the lady. You know? Actually, even so that's like not, like, I'm a human, so I can walk through the air. I don't even notice the air. If I were a whale and I'm going through the ocean, I would hardly notice the ocean. But if I'm a little teeny thing going through the ocean, then the water, it seems to me, would be heavy around me. I, I wouldn't be muscular enough to do the water. We're talking about things that are going to be living in thick, mooky environments, right? Or well, actually, the interesting thing, if you take regular, even if you take regular water and you make something really small, like the micro scale, like even for a bacteria, uh, that water is almost like honey to you. At that scale, like honey? Like, yeah, this yeah. viscosity, viscosity with this, how thick a liquid is, 
becomes really a, a large factor when it's that small. So uh, bacteria can't really swim the way we swim. Because we, we use like momentum. When you swim, you actually glide on the water. A bacteria doesn't glide. If a bacteria tries to propel itself, it'll stop immediately because it's, it's like Water is almost like honey for a bacteria, so we continuously have to you know, use some kind of corkscrew mechanism well, or something. Isn't that a mystery forward. to you? Because you've just described a human body as an extraordinarily efficient energy user, mm -hmm. and yet you're describing uh, little things that have to fight their way to any goal. Yeah, so and that would be hard to be efficient in an environment like that. Well, the, the interesting thing is that um, the reason why you have to fight your way to, to every goal is because you're surrounded. The, the, this viscosity, that the fact that water seems so, so heavy to move, is actually th related to what we talked about earlier, that the molecules are always bombarding this little thing. Because yeah. if you're trying to move through a storm where you get bombarded all the time, it's going to be very tough to walk through. And that's really the origin of this viscosity. But actually, in the, this storm also contains energy. So if you're that small, what happens at nanoscale, actually, that is that you can convert different types of energy very easily into each other. So you can actually take some of that energy, that thermal energy that always jiggles everything around, if you have some other input of chemical energy from your food, and you can turn it into motion, you can turn it into electrical energy, you can turn it into all kinds of things very oh. easily. And that only can be possible at the nanoscale. And that's why our cells... Oh, so you not only have your own energy sources, but you can borrow from the wind and the turbulence you were describing, and you can use that. You can, yeah. Oh. Interesting. All right, so, so uh, let us, you have what I would call the queer effects lecture that you sometimes give. Like when you live down in this world, uh, I would think, for example, surfaces must, well, tell, me, tell us what, you, what you've noticed. Like pretend to be a little thing and tell us what queer stuff happens to you. So there, there's many different uh, things. Uh, we have a few examples here. For example, gravity is completely, uh, um, doesn't play any role at the nanoscale. If you have a car, if I have a, uh, charge up your car to 100 volts, then uh, even you know, that force, electrical force, would be still 100 million times smaller than the gravity that acts on your car. But if you take something like a DNA, gravity doesn't ma matter anything. But actually, everything is controlled by electrical force because the molecule like DNA has a charge on it. Um, what do you mean there's no gravity for a DNA molecule? I mean, there is, but it's so tiny because it doesn't have any mass to it. Huh. So everything is really controlled by electrical forces in so your body. So a DNA molecule never has the experience of dropping off of something? Uh, no, Just I mean... It folds, you, folds, folds, and never... You could say to a DNA molecule, how about a drop, and they wouldn't know what... Dropping off your ant wouldn't mean anything to a DNA molecule. No, I mean, if no. you just had a little strand I'm of sorry, DNA like know, that, I it would just be floating you around. Should go on and talk so that's that. one of the examples. The other one I mentioned is the one that all these... Uh, okay, here's another example. Another one is the surface-to-volume ratio. Um, when you make something really small, the surface becomes really important. So you can see here between a, a baseball and, and a basketball, already you're going a tenfold in the ratio of surface-to-volume. But if you go to the nanoscale, uh, you're going a million times more than that. And really, everything's determined by interfaces between things. Every, there's always like, volume doesn't really matter what, what's in the volume. Everything is at some kind of interface. Everything interfaces with something else. Well, there's a surface that, if a surface is more important, does it get stickier or...? Uh... Yeah, I mean, also because of the electrical forces. So you could say, um, and that's a big problem by making little machines. If you really make a nanoscale machine, how do you keep things from sticking to each other? So you have to coat them to balance those electrical forces so that you don't have this sticking effect. Otherwise, everything would be just stick to each other. So if you, so if you had a nano bat and a nano ball, they would not... One yeah, could yeah not that's hit where, the you know, the, ba the, the oh. baseball things... Yeah. You know, a nano baseball would just stick to the nano bat. <laughs> and um, so here, here's just a, a kind of some numbers to this uh, thermal motion that, that these uh, molecules in your cells experience. I tried to calculate it, and it came out of being, having like a car being pummeled by about 70,000 miles per hour wind from random direction, though. So a changing direction, like... A thousand miles an hour wind? Yeah. That's, that's kind of this, the, the energy that, that, you know, is input, I mean, if you scale it up to the size of a car. Uh, but, of course, it's completely random direction, so it would average to, to, so, to nothing. So that's why it tells you that these machines that now cells are very different from the kind of machines that we are used to. They have to deal with this kind of very random, violent... Um, so they have to be very flexible, but at the same time very um, sturdy also. So they kind of balance between being flexible and sturdy and, and trying to you know, basically navigate this kind of chaos. So it's a very different world when you're at the nanoscale. And you have a natural nanobot video? What is that? So um, there's a, a professor at, um, in Japan called Toshio Ando, and he uses this... Uh, 
scanning force uh, uh, microscope, atomic force microscope that is early, and he perfected it so it scans so fast that basically moves your tip so fast it can make an image in about 100 milliseconds. And what you see there is, is a molecule, it's a, it's a myosin molecule, just like the one we saw in that movie, that was a kinesin, but it's similar, walking on an actin, uh, which is basically like a, a, a track, and you see a molecule that's this only 50... This is the real thing? This is the real thing, that's a real 50 nanometer molecule that's... They live in your cells, but this was, of course, extracted, and it's walking. This is the real thing. Wow. The, the total image here is about maybe 100 nanometers by uh, maybe 200 nanometers. That's the total image here. You can actually see... Um, so that's, the, that's the, the protein that's sort of moving yeah, up it's, a tube? Yeah, it's a protein, and, and it's, it's driven by um, using ATP, which is the chemical energy we use in our cells, and the thermal motion of the water around it, and it turns it into this directed motion just walking on this, on this track. And this is how cells transport cargo in your cells. And this is basically um, extracted from a cell. It's a, a, a protein, a walking protein. This is a nanobot in your cells, basically. And this it, little real, critter real is working under the working conditions you just described. Yeah. Enormous winds, uh, right. sticky surfaces, right. all these things. Right. And uh, the nice thing about these, that's the special thing on nanoscale, you can take a machine like that and extract it from a cell, and you stick it in a beaker, and you feed it with ATP, and it will just do this all by itself, just autonomously. So you give it its natural food, and off it goes. Yeah. Wow. OK. Um, speaking of miracles, now it's ready for you in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, one of your many companies, I don't know. Which one is it, by the way? Is it um, Bind, Blend, or Select that made your cancer cell hunting thing? Bind Therapeutics is a company that developed targeted nanoparticles for cancer treatment. So it's a bind, this is a Bind project, product. Can you describe what it is you made? So the, uh, the technology and, and what got developed are nanoparticles that are 100 nanometer in diameter, or about in that range. Um, from a reference perspective, that means you can put about 1,000 of them side by side in the cross-section of your hair. The nanoparticles are designed to have several properties. One, they can entrap a drug molecule and release it in a regulated and controlled way. Two, their surface is designed to go under the radar of the immune system, and so they are undetected in the body. And remember, your body has been evolved to recognize garbage and clear it. And so in this case, while the body would recognize it as garbage, it goes under the radar so it doesn't get cleared. And then the third design was that the surface of the nanoparticles, the outside, the part that is facing the body, has molecules on it, homing molecules, like the GPS in your car, that can recognize an abnormal cell, like a cancer cell, from a normal cell. Because when a cell becomes diseased, it begins to express different genes, different proteins. And so the molecular signature of a cancer cell and normal cell differ. That difference in molecular signature is both in what's going on inside the cell and what's going on in the cell surface. So the outside of the cancer cell actually has a different, if you would, landscape as outside of a normal cell. Let me just see if I can repeat what you just said. You stick something in you that goes into your bloodstream and kind of wanders around. It can select abnormal cells. So it recognizes good cell, good cell, good cell, oop, cancer cell. Good cell, good cell, good, oop, cancer cell. Then once it identifies them, it goes over, it knocks on their door, and does something, but enters the, enters the cancer cell and not the good cells? Right, yeah, and they, doesn't get eaten by the immune system. That's right. The nanoparticles can specifically recognize the cells that are diseased, cancer cells, bind to the cancer cells, and they bind not on one point. They're like Velcro. They get stuck. And that stickiness of a nanoparticle on the surface of a cell actually makes the cell think that there's something abnormal going on on the surface, and in order to clear it up, it brings it in. Ooh. And when it brings it in, it's like a Trojan horse. When it brings it in, what it's bringing in is a nanoparticle that is loaded with drug molecule. And so the- With drug, mean with a poison that's going to kill it. That's right, with a poison that's going to that's kill it. That's a nice way to say it. 
but it's not what I you was meant. saying it the nice way, yeah. but you're right. If you're a cancer cell, it would be a bad thing that to bring those nanoparticles inside. Let me go back for a second. You're in the body, you're moving around, you're going cancer cell, cancer cell, cancer cell. Uh, why don't the defense system of the body say, well, I don't know, there's a stranger here trying to, it's a foreigner, let's kill it. That's what our immune system is designed to do. You said it's under the radar. What's yeah, how so, to get under the radar? So the best way to, uh, if you would, create this cloak around yourself is to put water around yourself. And when you do that, uh, the uh, immune system doesn't recognize it. Now here what we're seeing is a stealth nanoparticle is being decorated on a surface by targeting molecules, those GPS. And now that nanoparticle can recognize an abnormal cell from a normal cell. And so when it gets to an abnormal cell, it binds to the cell surface like a Velcro. And that binding then triggers an uptake of that Trojan horse inside of the cell where suddenly an incredibly large payload of drug gets delivered to that cancer cell. So those are bombs going in, really. Huh. <laughs> but you didn't explain to me why the immune system didn't kill it before it did any of those things. So here, for example, we're seeing basically... So it's covered with water. This is basically, you know, if you would, biodegradable plastic that's grabbing drugs and creating a surface that is water-like. So that's a water layer on the surface of that nanoparticle. Is this like a Harry Potter close cloak of invisibility kind of thing? I've, I've, I've never watched a Harry Potter movie, but I, but, but I can understand that <laughs> Harry Potter was a smart guy, so I think you know, that's right. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe if you go to the early Harry Potter movie, he's not the tallest person really in the world anyway, but, but may, isn't it like this, you, these are nanoparticles, right? So there's, are they bigger or smaller than the cells they enter? I assume they're smaller. I think a good comparator is that if you grab, you know, a, a cherry and take a bite of it, that's about what that nanoparticle would be to a normal cell. You know, somewhere, small fruit that you take a bite, that's the relative size difference. So it's, it's, it slips in because it's teeny and because it's invited and because it's a Trojan horse and then it goes in and goes boom. Yeah, I mean, I think if you try to put a watermelon inside your mouth, it doesn't go, but a cherry goes in nicely. So the small size, <laughs> the small size is key, but also the targeting on, this, on the nanoparticle um, creates that tight binding and interaction with the cell and results in the optic. So does that mean that now, if I, inst I think a normal cancer patient would go in and get radiated or it would take a, uh, some kind of toxin and it would kill the good cells and the bad cells. It sounds like you have now figured out a way to, to find the, the bad cells and not harm the good cells. Yeah, I think the technology certainly allows to become much more efficacious because the cells that are intended to see the poison see more of it, and also become safer, because the parts of the bodies that are not intended to see the cell, the drug, the poison, see much less of it. And, you know, in, in the but medical... Does that mean that I can go and have a cancer treatment with your stuff and go out and play tennis in the afternoon? Like, do I, like a lot of people go and they feel horrible after their treatment and they have to wait a week. But maybe with yours, like, I'm just going... <laughs> to the bad guys and the good guys are all ready to play tennis. They just say... Well, well let, me tell you, let me just tell you this, this story, which is that when, when uh, this work was published and, and, um, and this, it came out in uh, April of 2012 in a journal called Science Translational Medicine, and when, when Bind decided to publish the paper, it was a cover article, um, uh, you know, in Bind, and there was a tremendous amount of publicity that came around this, and, and the reporters, and I'm not sure how, they managed to figure out what one of the patients, who one of the patients were. And, and so she actually, and I didn't know this, I was actually very surprised when I saw it in the paper. So this particular patient came out and told her story and said, number one, her name is Evelyn Swanson, she's wonderful. Uh, and she basically came Are you allowed to say her name? Like, yeah. You're allowed to say Evelyn well, Schwartz? Well, she was, in the, she, was in the, she was in the paper. Oh, okay. She came and she told her own story in the paper. Okay. And what she said was, that, and I'm quoting, that I feel so good that I, that I think you're giving me placebo. Uh, 
<laughs> now, 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 that said, to me, that, you know, that's an unusual response, but because typically oncologists like to give as much drug as they can to get efficacy, and so you always go to this sort of the limit of tolerability of the drug. Uh. But the key is that the, um, you know, the data today is promising, but in, in, um, in drug development, the road is long, and we have to be um, cautious, but we are optimistically cautious that what we have is, is potentially a paradigm shift in the treatment of diseases like cancer. So let me ask you what I think a lot of people have in their minds. Like how, I mean, these are, these are beginning to be robots. The ones we saw originally that just kind of flush through your system, those aren't robots, those are just cameras that are skidding on blood, I guess. So that, I don't count them. But now that we're beginning to build the ones that you, the squishy one and with the magnet, all right, but that's now being directed by a doctor who puts a magnet. Now your guy, your guy, what is the, what's powering your, uh, your going into the cell thing? Well, the nanoparticles circulate around the body because the blood circulates. Oh, so they're, um, just, they're doing the same thing. Just and so through. they're circulating with the, with the other cells and the other proteins in the blood. When they get to uh, tumors, the blood vessels of the tumors are abnormal. So, oh, so they your sense. blood vessels are typically like pipes in your house. Right. Water goes around, but the water doesn't leak into the walls. Around tumors, it's as if those faucets are leaky. Things leak out of the blood vessels. So when a nanoparticle comes in the vicinity of the blood vessels of cancer, it leaks out passively. It leaks out and it But that's begins. a bloodhound effect. It goes sniff, sniff, something's wrong over there, I'm going to it. And it gets out. Yeah. Once it gets out, it then the um, forces of fluid that are in the um, tumor environment move things around like proteins and nanoparticles, etc. And when those nanoparticles then recognize or see a cell that has that abnormality, they bind to it and they get taken out. But what about our normal Jetsons idea of robots? Our Jetsons robot doesn't wait for chemical gradations, doesn't get controlled by a magnet, doesn't slide along with blood. It moves on its own power with a logic that belongs to it. It's a sort of, it's, it's a robot, so it can author its own motion. The, the thing that he described in the beginning of this talk are that the, the world was somehow able to turn the sh jiggling of atoms into purposeful motion. So snowflakes form, I mean, they don't have to have, they just, they do these things elegantly and well on their own. How long will it be before you get, I think it was, it was Feynman in his talk talked about, what was the phrase about the robot use the, the vision? S swallow the doctor. Swallow the doctor. How long will it be before you can put things in you that will just go about and say, well, you're looking good, Jeff, but uh, I see a little bump here. If you don't mind, I'm going to take this out, and then I'll, you can poop me out later. And Oh, and over here, I'm going to see that you have a little retinal issue. You seem to be colorblind, so I'm going to add a little touch of pigment here, and basically a, a, a repairman in mm. you. Is that like a thousand years from now, or what? Well, I think if you just look at what has happened to the field, um, we've seen an exponential growth in the scientific publications that are coming out on nanotechnology. Yeah, so, but that could be because the government pays money for things like but, this. But let me, give, let, me, let me put that in perspective. So, in 1980, there were two papers published on nanoparticles in the year 1980. In the year 2000, there were about 330 papers published on nanoparticles. This is 2000. In 2010, there were 11,000 papers. In 2011, 14,000 papers. In if you're waiting for me to go, ooh, I will, but I've, there are probably 14,000 string theory papers too, but so what? But, but, the re <laughs> but the reason I say that, the reason I say that is that if you look at uh, the pace of discovery, it's enormous, fast. So today, for example, targeted nanoparticles are in clinical trials. Very near term, we're going to see nanoparticles. In fact, they're developed today. You, you, we're testing them in mice. Nanoparticles that can 
image and treat at the same time, or even sense drug delivery. Nanoparticles that can sense your glucose concentration, and if it's too high, then release their insulin. Or nanoparticles huh. that can go around the body and not release the drug, but release it in the environment of infection, which is typically acidic, or cancers, which is typically acidic. So these smart nanoparticles um, are being developed today, and you know, they're not very far from reaching clinical trials, but the road in clinical trial is long um, because safety is key. Who, and so who regulates these things? Is this the Federal the Food and Drug Administration? Or? Yes, if FDA regulates it, and FDA actually came out, and the, the um, standard they've taken today is that um, the guidelines that govern uh, drug safety are sufficiently robust to be applied to nanoparticle uh, drugs and products. Um, and so the existing... Uh, so you uh, have to convince the FDA that you're safe. That's exactly right. Like any other drug, uh, you go in and you go in at very low doses, you slowly move up. Once you have a dose that is well tolerated, you then expand your patient population and begin to test it for efficacy. But safety is first, and before you go to human, you know, you do sort of multiple species of animals, et cetera, to be certain that the risk-benefit um, ratio merits testing this in man. What about, the, the, is there, like with other fancy new technologies, like you say, so you go, you build a, a nuclear reactor, you go, oops, we have some waste product here, and no one knows where to put it. Uh, you get other technologies which create waste, and in this case, is there any disposal issues here? Like if you, s it seems like you can make these little things that squish and deliver their juices and so forth, and out they poop, and then you can wash them and do, use them again. Is there any reason to worry about how you, is there any garbage issue here, like a, a toxic So garbage? I would say the answer is um, a, a maybe. Maybe. And it's a maybe because it depends on the nanomaterial that you used in the development of your particles. So the materials that are used in the context of the particles that we have worked with are uh, based on um, the same material that the resorbable sutures are uh, used. And resorbable sutures have been around since the 60s. Now, in, in mid-1970s, a very famed professor, Professor Robert Langer, at the time he was that's a professor. Your prof that's your guy. That's right. He's my mentor. Uh, I, I, I did my postdoc training at Professor Langer's lab at MIT. Professor Langer in the 1970s showed that he can use the same material that the resorbable sutures are made of, but actually you're just telling me all the wonderful ways you can recycle. I asked you whether there's any garbage you're scared of. But I, what I was saying was that in this case, this material breaks down into carbon dioxide and water okay. and energy. So why now, did you say maybe? Like, it sounds like everything's golden and glorious. Because if you then begin to work with some of the inorganic material that are not readily cleared from the body, um, people are using carbon nanotubes, and they're seeing that carbon nanotubes stay in the liver months later after you know, studies in animals. It depends on the nanomaterial. Some of the nanomaterials are biodegradable or bioeliminable, and after they do their thing in the body, which is deliver a drug to a particular site, they actually dissolve and go away. And in some cases, they can dissolve into things that are actually useful for you, like but lactic acid and glycolic acid. Sometimes to make this acid. shorter, sometimes you just take a lot of medicines and you've got all this, you, and you do a little wiggle and you've got a lot of jingling nanocarbon molecules in your tummy that don't go away? Well, carbon nanotubes, nanotubes. carbon nanotubes have, you know, single component, have not, to the best of my knowledge, entered clinical trial yet. Ah. Um, That's your sneaky way of saying you, we have a junk problem with carbon nanomolecules. Well, no, but I, but I think a lot of these things, uh, you know, may be addressed, and not, always, not all the scientific problems can be addressed, but the ones that eventually merit the, you know, the sort of the sufficient bar of safety make it to go forward. And I'm optimistic that new nanomaterials are going to be developed that are safe enough to go to the clinic, and a number of them have. You know, for example, iron oxide nanoparticles can be used for imaging, but they're also used today for iron replacement. Those are iron oxide nanoparticles. 
uh, you know, in the 30 nanometer uh, scale. I just hate to have to poop on Tuesdays and have to put that in a special bowl or something. <laughs> Here's my last question, you guys. I, uh, so we've talked about using this stuff to, to repair ourselves. Is there an enhancement quality? I mean, could one day you use it to improve yourself? So you, I don't know, maybe you could create a nanoparticle that could see ultraviolet, and then you could, have an, you could look at a rainbow and see what a, what a butterfly gets to see, which is more color, or something like that. Is that even in the, you know, are, among other things, are you guys uh, in the Frankenstein business, ultimately, where you will try to improve us? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that because that would intimidate you. We are in the, in the make us more beautiful, more powerful, and more lovely business. I think um, you know, one thing about these particles and robots we talked about is that they don't reproduce themselves and they don't really play into your DNA. So, so that's why they're fairly safe because you know, you, you, they get broken down and, and they don't multiply themselves, not like a virus, you know. So if you want to do something where you enhance well, wasn't yourself, there always you would a have kind of, to wasn't there always a myth that, that one, one day these things would learn to replicate themselves, and then you'd get, a you'd get a nanoparticle that could make a littler nanoparticle, which would learn to make an even littler nanoparticle, so that the particles themselves would create new opportunities for themselves? Wasn't there that? Well, there's, you know, there's books like that, of course, Michael Crichton or something like that. But, well, um, I, I, that was the scary part. But th there's yeah. also a, a nice part where you could just get these guys to sort of invent themselves. Yeah, that was actually Feynman's idea. He actually thought that you could make a little, um, you know, uh, machine that make a, makes a smaller machine, which, which is a which copy of itself, which is smaller. Can you do that or no? Yeah, you know, the problem with that is actually that when you get to the nanoscale, different rules apply. Uh. So if you keep making a small machine smaller and smaller, eventually it doesn't work anymore. You have to change how the machine works once you get smaller. Okay. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing, I think the real danger is when you actually have machines that play with your DNA. Then, you know, if you're trying to improve yourself, that's really what you really have to do. And that's okay. when safety issues become really serious. But with these things, I don't think it's that extreme. Well, okay. Apparently, you are the only person in this entire room with a question, but I'm very <laughs> interested to hear it. Actually combines several things, including what Mr. Krulowicz was leading to before in terms of uh, computer-generated nanobots. That is, those uh, nanobots that are self-actuating in terms of having an onboard computer that is programmed to do all of the functions that you're talking about. That is, investigation, uh, drug delivery or whatever else, or just general investigation. Could you give us any idea as to what the current state of science is with respect to construction of atomic, virtually atomic scaled computers that would then be inserted or as part of a group of nanobots that could do all of those functions? How far is it somewhere on the drawing board now? Because we read why a lot you, about why that. do you want like why would you want to have a nanobot with a nano computer? I don't know. It sounds like a why would we want it? Yeah. For my understanding, it's almost inevitable. This is just the way that technology is advancing. Whether you want it or not, there are <laughs> going to be those who are going to start investigating these functions. Okay. So I'm asking currently, uh, are there okay. real work being done in that regard? So um, I, I will try to answer a little bit. So my, my opinion is that that would take a very long time. A, a, a few, uh, it's, there's a lot of technological hurdles. One is the energy. How do you get energy to something like that when it's that small? How do you uh, keep things from um, you know, sticking in place or being... being uh, you know, the, the, the biology solved this problem kind of uh, over billions of years. So, so there, there are these kind of little machines that, that do all this stuff. They're called, for example, bacteria. Right. You know, they're, they're, they're autonomous, they can walk around and they can take energy and can do all this kind of stuff and they're about a micron in size. That's about, in terms of, we may run into some of the laws of physics. So you can make a computer, for example, you could make a computing machine that runs on atoms where it stores in, uh, information in, in, in atomic positions, but how do you have them move around? Yeah, this how is does a it, kind of a high a level. Lot, this so is I would like say, nanos making nanocomputers, so yeah, it's so like I would a whole say, little... Uh, that's, a, that's a 50 to 100 year kind of thing, yeah. uh, if, if it's... Possible. I think there's a lot of fundamental problems, but but uh, people work on different uh, pieces on that. Yeah, I, would I, say. I can tell a very quick thing. The only thing real right now is DNA computing is the only real thing at nanoscale. 
that is being currently scientifically demonstrated that we can use DNA and by genetically engineering it, DNA can be used as a computer. That's true. Um, so that's why there are some developments, but the, our image of nanorobots is all these science fiction uh, you know, images of a shrink down submarine should completely change because that's really science fiction only. And everything will happen with all these particles, DNAs, uh, cells, and synthetic materials all together. And they'll be really dirty, they'll be very non-elegant as nature, as all these evolutionary DNA kind of beautiful you know, structures. But definitely there are trends that towards these things being possible, but they'll be biological or chemical com com computation and energy type of real things other than just uh, you know, chemical machines. Let's go to first Mr. Yellow Shirt and then Miss little Mr. White Shirt. So all this nanoparticle technology how come we don't have a commercially available process to take proteins and nanoparticles and to be sustained release and still maintain its activity? For example, uh, if you take uh, something like bot uh, uh, Botox or, uh, or Lucentis for macular degeneration, how come you inject it and you uh, it, it doesn't maintain its uh, uh, activity for a month or two months or three months. I know proteins easily degenerate, but the, we don't have a commercial process to prevent that and then to be reactivated. So the question is like, how rate. come these things don't last? I think the question, if I understood it correctly, is a very insightful one. What you're saying is that proteins have a formulation challenge that nanoparticles can't uh, entrap them and release them in the bioavailable and the bioactive form. And I right. think it's actually a remarkably insightful question. And the answer is, that's a process issue. Yes. Uh, the, the challenge is that um, if you look at proteins, it depends on size. If you're talking about a small protein like insulin, then you actually can encapsulate insulin in a nanoparticle, and you could release insulin in its bioactive form and lose very little activity of insulin. Once you get into the, uh, uh, you know, the 100 uh, plus uh, kilodalton size, or 150 is the size of an antibody, um, and, I, and I think Lucentis is a, is a, is a full uh, you know, size monoclonal antibody, so that you're in that size range, it becomes difficult to put a, a structure that on its own has a diameter of about 15 nanometer in a nanoparticle that is only 80 to 100 nanometer. So it's just a size problem. That molecule is too big to be encapsulated in a nanoparticle in an efficient enough way and released in a bioactive form. But it's a formulation issue, and I think if you increase the particle size, now in the case of Lucentis, you give that drug intraocularly, so it, you don't need to be in a nanometer scale. If you get into the hundreds of nanometer scale from a particle perspective, then you actually can put Lucentis in a particle and release it in the bioactive form. How about you? We're talking about stealth particles, about underlayer. Why not just become a layer? So the question is that why does the nanoparticle become stealth and goes under the radar immune system? Why doesn't it actually become a radar itself and goes around and find things potentially as a radar? Is that, am I correct in that question? That yeah, I think, it's, I think it's an excellent question. Um, so I, I suppose, um, well, two things. The, in my language of what I said, in fact, both could be true because one could view the nanoparticles as in fact having a radar and going around and finding things. But now we're talking about just our sort of explanation of what is happening. Now the question is, and I'll ask my colleagues here, is can you actually make a nanoscale radar that can go in the body and find things? Impossible. <laughs> by, by the way, he has an opening in his lap for a job if you're looking for one. <laughs> for summer internship. <laughs> There are laws in New York State about that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, okay, get Mr. Blue Shirt. Okay, so you say at a tumor site, the circulation is different so that it's kind of a leaky vasculature. Um, so how do you design a nanoparticle that can diffuse into the um, tumor site to the cancer cell 
while fighting the outward convection of the, um, the tumor cell, like the way the blood flows? Again, another very insightful question. Um, so that is, in fact, a very well-debated topic. Um, are there any research papers that show that nanoparticles can overcome the EPR effect and diffuse to the cancer cell? Yeah, I think, again, a, a excellent question. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the camps. There is the Rakesh Jain camp, Professor Jain at Harvard, um, who believes that in order for nanoparticles to readily permeate through the tumor interstitium, they need to be in the size of about 20 to 30 nanometer that that's the size range that can actually create effective tumor penetration. Um, there is a significant validity in that size is a hindrance to uh, tissue penetration, and it also depends on tissue. Diseases like pancreatic cancer are very dense, um, and, but diseases like, say, kidney cancers are very vascular. So, it also depends on a therapeutic area to therapeutic area and indication to indication where that answer will be variable. But so in our experience, certainly particles that are in the um, you know, 80 to 100 nanometer size range can create two phenomena. One, a large depot of drugs locally in the tumor that the small molecule drug itself can permeate, and also particles themselves can get into the cells. The, the distance of diffusion of the particle uh, from the vascular scape, how many layers does a particle escape, um, hasn't necessarily been studied very closely, but it's an excellent question. Okay, so, Rita, you guys can meet later, I think, in this particular. <laughs> let me just, I'm only going to have time for about two more. But no, seriously, you can come up to the stage after, and he, he has to jump in. He actually has to file something in Washington or something by midnight. So if you talk fast, uh, how about Mr. Blue Jeans? That's yes, here. <laughs> um, my question is more: How commercially viable do you see this in the future? Like, obviously, you're you're a businessman, and you see, seeing this go forward. Like, we know that technology exponentially gets better and better. Um, like the the thirty exponential steps question. Like, technology helps itself double on in the future. Like, ten years ago a PS2 had a 26 megabyte memory card, and now we're talking about the next Xbox with an eight core processor and hyper-threading. How do you see this going forward on the nano scale? Like, the power of nano, like, uh, ironically enough, how big do you see the small getting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, so big, I'm assuming big, you mean commercial big, Commercially is that correct? And yeah effectiveness, long range term. Sure, so, so if, you look at, if you look at drug development, uh, you know, it's a tough business. So overall, 9% of the drugs that enter clinical trials ever get approved. And if you look at cancer, that, drug, that number is actually closer to 6%. So when you enter human, you get a 6% chance of success. If you then factor in all the failures, that has to occur in order for a drug to become successful, um, then it's no surprise that, depending on whose uh, reports you're reading, a cost of a drug getting approved can be as much as $4 billion. Now, the dynamic, the payer dynamic has also significantly changed. Ten years ago, you could develop a drug that was just incrementally better, and you would actually have a very successful drug launch commercially. Today, drugs need to be materially better in improving survival. Um, certainly for drugs in indications that there's approved drugs already, then survival advantage is, is, is really required from a commercial success perspective. Now, what nanotechnology gives you is an additional layer that helps you against failing, because many drugs fail for lack of efficacy or toxicity. So if nanotechnology can make a drug safer and more effective, then potentially fewer drugs could fail in clinical trials. 
that can decrease the overall cost of what it, what it takes to actually get a drug approved that frankly would translate into less expensive drugs for patients. The reason some drugs cost as much as 100, 200,000 a year uh, is because you need to recoup that cost of multi hundred million or billions of drugs that you spend on drugs. But if you could get drugs approved less expensively, you also don't have to necessarily price them so high um, to, to stay as a viable business. So I actually think that commercially, there is a, a tremendous advantages um, to incorporating nanotechnology in a drug development process. Uh, last question, I'm sorry for you guys, I think we're just about to hit the wall. So how about Ms. Sweater? We didn't really get into um, this section about uh, DNA fixing DNA mutations, but that was something that really want, I wanted to come here for. Um, but one of my big questions is, if we're going in and using nano, nanotechnology to help mutations in genes, that could essentially possibly stifle our own evolution process. I know that we wouldn't want to, I mean, it's just a thought that crossed my mind. We wouldn't want to uh, fix anything that's going to help us survive. But then again, if there's something that comes up in our genetic code that's a mutation that we automatically foresee as being something bad, how do we have the foresight to understand that that's not part of some sort of evolutionary um, just basically, where do we get the foresight for that? And I'm not saying that it's bad to cure cancer with definitely technology, but I was just thinking about that from that perspective. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there are, uh, first of all, there are ways to use nanoparticles to actually do uh, change DNA, to do basically DNA therapy kind of things. Uh, that, for example, at Wayne State, there's people who do this kind of thing. Um, not on humans, of course, this is all very experimental. Um, this is just done in cell lines. Um, if, you know, if you're just changing certain cells in your body, it's not going to change the evolution because it has to go into your germ cells to do anything like that. Uh, of course, there's this whole, and then maybe you will know more about this, the whole area of epigenetics. And uh, so I'm not, uh, I think people you don't, don't quite ever, understand. Don't do that. Epigenetics at the last question. That would no, be okay, we won't do that. <laughs> so, so again, it's a safety thing that you need to take out. But if you say, for example, want to fix a genetic defect in, in a human, it's, uh, uh, say, um, what's a good genetic disease? I'm trying to think. Um, well, you know, any kind of. Uh, huh? Tay Sachs, they said. Okay. So. Um, you would, you would basically just fix the cells in your body that you know you have right now, and it would, you would be formulated so it doesn't go into your germ cells. It would just fix this as, as individual, so it wouldn't like lead to any evolution because you're not, you know, yeah, giving it to your offspring. So, but but it, you know, so far this hasn't been too successful. I mean, people have tried some gene therapy, and it, it's very mm -hmm. difficult to do because um, um, when you start playing with if you're delivering a drug, basically, it's, it's, it's a fairly safe thing because you're delivering a drug to a cell, a certain types of cells, and they die, and that's it. But if you start playing with DNA, you don't know what the cascading effect of that will be because you're, you, you, you're changing the whole uh, thing that happens in your cells, and if you do it all over your body, you really don't know what kind of side effect that has. So it's a much more complicated thing to do. Thank you very much for being with us the whole time. Thank you.